For Krima Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Zamini. Joining me today is a Johannesburg-based development economist, columnist, radio presenter, photographer, and activist, Ayabonga Gawe, to discuss his book titled, The Economy on Your Doorstep, the political economy that explains why South African economy misfires and what to do about it. So Ayabonga, your book pulls together our history as well as focusing on economic policy issues. Why do you think it is important uh, for us to understand uh, our history if we wish to address the country's economic problems? I think economies by their nature are socially contingent you know, uh, uh, processes or economic processes. Um, and markets, the emergence of markets, or even the evolution of people's preferences as consumers, or even the evolution of firms in marketplaces, are all socially contingent and socially driven processes. And you can't understand social processes or even social change without a keen understanding of history. And so for me, a big part of my own practice as an economist is about taking a multidisciplinary approach to try and understand very, very complex economic reality that is that can't, in my view, just be understood through uh, analyses, both qualitatively and quantitatively, that think of economies as things that sit outside of social processes, of social change and evolutionary change. And I think history becomes an important tool and instrument in trying to locate a lot of that social change in specific and very concrete realities that people are living in. Uh, and that's why it's such an important thread that runs through throughout the course of the book. Mm, and in the book, you also warn that if economic development does not occur in the former Bantustan areas, mm. our country as a whole will not develop. Why do you argue this? So I argue that a big part of the problem and also the solution in South Africa lies in what apartheid had intentionally created as economic wastelands of our society, placed on the margins in what are called the TBVC states. And those played a very functional role in capitalist accumulation under settler colonialism and also under uh, apartheid, least of all since the discovery of gold and diamonds in the late 19th century in South Africa. And I argue that even in the post-apartheid period, you find the worst development indicators and outcomes in those places. So if you go to a province like the Eastern Cape, where I come from, all of the places that have the worst outcomes in terms of service coverage, in terms of economic indicators, in terms of the stunting of children uh, before they reach, you know, even school going age, all happen to be in the places that used to be in the former Transkei and the Siskei. And so in a sense, when you speak about development in South Africa, you can't speak of that outside of the concrete socioeconomic reality of the former homelands. And that's why I dedicate a significant space in the book, trying to understand the household in the homelands, trying to understand the firms that at some stage in our history have emerged in the homelands. And more importantly, being able to try and locate that in the potential and the possibilities uh, and the abundant potential that already exists in many of these places, uh, which we haven't tapped into in very, very meaningful ways. And so, so in a sense, I argue that a big part of the development challenge of South Africa is confronting and overcoming that native reserve and its manifestations, not only in the homelands, but also in the margins of the urban uh, periphery. So you can't separate, for instance, uh, the issues of the Transkei and the Siskei from the socioeconomic conditions of the margins of Cape Town, for instance, because that is a major migrant route for many people in the places that I come from. Nor can you separate the challenges of underdevelopment in parts of the Northwest and Limpopo from the underdevelopment and the socioeconomic conditions of the margins of Johannesburg and in other parts of the Gauteng city region. And so in a sense, the native reserve is critical to try and understand what about the South African economy continues to account for these weak outcomes. I mean, we have higher unemployment in South Africa than even relatively poorer countries. You know, there are countries who perform better on unemployment indicators uh, than South Africa that don't have the depth, diversity of industrialization that we have in this country. Now, what does that suggest? What it suggests is that the historic processes of accumulation by dispossession, so dispossessing people in those areas of the ability to survive outside of wage employment, has had implications for the current moment and even our future and our ability to get people to participate in the economy. In other African countries, 
there are much higher levels of labor force participation and economic participation, largely due to the ability of livelihood alternatives in the agrarian economy. We don't have that in South Africa because the evolution of the agrarian economy was arrested by the imperatives of migrant labor, by the imperatives of the minerals energy complex. And so if you go to where I come from, you know, in Lady Frere, in the Emma Lathleni district in the Eastern Cape, people might be on land, but the big question around the productive potential or the productivity of that land um, is largely a difficult issue because even your household human resource structure is one of very young people and very, very old people. All of us are in the city uh, and we join an intergenerational relay of people who at a certain age, uh, at a certain productive age, where we are joining the workforce between the ages of 15 and 64, your entire workforce of those places is not in those places. So even if you wanted to produce anything, you don't have labor. Uh, and that's the starting point. And I think a big part of uh, the challenge of unemployment in the urban centers has a lot to do with the decimation of the productive capability of the rural areas in South Africa. And so your solution is, has to be around the restoration of agrarian and productive activity that not only is in agriculture, but in all of the related value chains uh, that would make for vibrant livelihood opportunities in the villages and in the townships of the former TBVC states. So you also seem to have a strong sense that local economic development is also key if we wish to improve uh, economic performance. Can you please explain this insight? All of the things that I've said are not possible if you don't have what I call developmental local government. A lot of people speak about local economic development and the role that you know, state agencies and uh, municipalities can play in fostering certain types of economic activity at a municipal level. I take a, a slightly different but still micro type of interpretation of what I think is the role of local uh, municipalities. I think, and it's on two fronts. The first one is municipalities by their nature provide critical inputs to what I call in the book economic production and social reproductive activities. Now, economic production is what happens in firms, is what happens you know, in the broader economy, anything from a hairdresser to a factory. Those people are engaged in productive for exchange. So they produce things in exchange for money. But then social reproduction is the birthing, the rearing, and the raising of successive generations of the workforce, looking after the very young and the very old, caring for the ill and those who are unable to undertake economic production. Now you would imagine the provision of water, the provision of sanitation, the provision of waste removal, are all critical inputs not only to economic production, say in a car wash right up to you know, a factory that needs water, but are also critical to the making of meaning and the social reproductive tasks within the ambit of the household, the street, and the community. And so in a sense, the first layer is that critical role of government as a provider of inputs into economic and social reproductive activities. The second layer, of course, is what I argue even local government should be in our society, which is this idea of government as a taker of the risks in the first instance, but also as a market maker by serving as a buyer of last resort for people who want to produce things. We've got a major challenge in the Eastern Cape of, you know, at a household level, especially in the rural hinterland. Many households have livestock. Many households are engaged in some subsistence production for household food needs and also for feed needs for their livestock. Mm. Yet even those who produce beyond their subsistence requirements have no capability of adding value to those things and then exchanging them on terms that are relatively better than they otherwise would have done were it not for those investments. And my view is that it is the state at a local government level that must incentivize those investments. Mm. And how do you do that? You do that by signaling to those producers and saying, look, we will buy 10% of everything that you produce, all of the yellow maize that you are producing as feed so that we can feed our chickens, so that Ukoko can go and make sure that the chickens are able to lay eggs because they are fed well. We will buy a tenth of that production so that you don't worry about it wasting away. So that you know 
as you add value to it, you have got an offtake at least of 10% from government. And that crowds in other actors. And that then incentivizes that producer to reinvest in the next plowing and harvesting round into much better, you know, and much more productivity yielding investments, be it in labor and in capital, in order to expand their operations. And I think it's on that basis that we then create a basis for economic participation, a basis for accumulation for those who are interested in that. Uh, and the role of the state at a local government level is at a primary level, yes, to provide those inputs, but is to also send these signals through its buying and purchasing decisions, through its market making decisions that will allow other economic actors to reinvest in their activities, which by extension makes those activities viable. You know, other people speak of it uh, as, you know, intentional market uh, making and risk taking in the context of industrial policy. Uh, and I certainly see no difference uh, or, or no reason why uh, we would see the approaches different when it comes to trying to incentivize uh, economic production in many of the places that we come from. Ayabonga, you've also traveled to India. How would you compare yeah. the Indian and South African economies? Well, I think there are fundamental differences. There are also those things that, that would be the same. So let me maybe start off with what is the same. Because I talk about it in, in the article that emerged. We, I had an opportunity you know, to travel with a group of uh, media and ICT entrepreneurs uh, on an exchange to Bangalore, which in many ways is the heart of, of the ICT revolution in India. Now, India is the world's second most populous nation. You've got a billion strong you know, a, a population, massive consumer market, uh, which of course is a bit different to South Africa with its you know, a, a relatively smaller a population and smaller market. But what is the same are historic experiences of, of uh, you know, uh, colonialism and post-colonialism. There is, of course, the, the links between, you know, the diaspora in our own country, which has come through a certain historical experience to South Africa from India. Uh, and so those connections are there. There's also the connection, of course, uh, of the political questions. I mean, I think you know, one of the dynastic parties in that part of the world, the Indian National Congress, is, not, is you know, in many ways, it's politics, center-left, broad church, very much similar, you know, in many ways to the African National Congress that we have here. And historically, there have been historic ties between, you know, those two liberation movements. So, so there's a lot of that that is similar. But I think what the Indian, you know, uh, ecosystem has understood very early is that there are certain catalytic things that you can do that creates successive waves of economic activity. And the one that I talk about in the book, you know, is this investment in making connectivity ubiquitous. So just like investing in the electrification of people's homes leads to knock-on impacts in their demand for appliances and electronics, if you invest in the expansion of connectivity, a positive knock-on impact on both digitally traded services and other activities in the digital economy. And I think in South Africa, our stalling and delays in the uh, transition from analog to digital, in the allocation of spectrum, uh, you know, and also the oligopolistic market concentration in the ICT sector has prevented a similar type of advance. At a time when that advance could have served as a very important template for similar advances on our continent. Because if you want to benefit from the Indian experience, at least of all on, on volume, mm. you, you kind of have to think of South Africa as part of a bigger continental societal reality rather than just, you know, a, a 60 million strong population. Uh, if you think in those terms, then you start to see the continent as a massive billion strong consumer market that is set to be some of the largest consumer markets by 2050. I mean, we saw Ethiopia, the second most populous nation, liberalizing its telecommunications market uh, in the recent times. And it was South African players who, who were bidding for that uh, alongside some of their partners. Yet I don't think there's this acceptance, as we've seen in India, where you know, e-commerce is still a very much an urban phenomenon in South Africa. In India, we got to visit companies there who were driving millions and millions of transactions daily into rural areas you know, into places that don't even have a street name or even a signpost outside of their home. But people were collecting it at kiosks, collecting their products at kiosks. But they were able to see the product and by extension demand it because 
access to the internet was something that was ubiquitous and that was taken for granted. Now, that's just on the consumer experience, but think about what COVID-19 has taught us around working and learning during this moment. I spoke to Unisa and you can imagine, I mean, a massive distance learning institution like that on the continent could potentially position itself as a major e-learning monolith, could be massive in the Southern Hemisphere. Yet, but because we haven't resolved the internet issues for that lady who is in Mkanduli working uh, and also studying part-time, that has then prevented the ability of UNISA you know, to go into different arena on the basis of what they can offer by way of remote and distance learning uh, on an internet platform. Um, and that's why you, know, you still have a, a UNISA that in some cases is still reliant on sending you know, study material via the post office. Um, and so you can imagine there's all of these different potential value chains that could benefit from that. I mean, you know, it's sad that the post office with its reach uh, has not gone into the e-commerce space as much as some of the other courier players have done. Uh, and I think these are the things that once you sort out the internet as your enabler, have second, third, fourth, fifth round effects and knockovers and positive spillovers into other economic activities. And I think, you know, the more and more we delay the decisions around the allocation of spectrum, uh, the more the, you know, the higher the opportunity cost of what, uh, uh, whatever value we're leaving on the table. And lastly, Ayabonga, given the current economic problems in our country, as you've just mentioned a few, what solutions uh, do you recommend in your book? So I think the book in many ways, I mean, even though it has tried to, to really be a descriptive analysis of the economy around us, uh, has also tried to touch on some things that we could potentially do. And I think there's three things really that emerge from the Eastern Cape chapter, which are quite relevant for the broader national policy conversation. I think the first one is we have to make sure that we are able to secure in a context of rapid deindustrialization, COVID-19, uh, and massive challenges within the household is to secure the consumption basket in particular of poor households. Mm. And of course, this requires progressive improvement in our existing grants framework and the introduction of new social wage interventions that'll be able to cushion poor households from the impacts of multiple crises that are being visited on their homes. And these crises are not only crises of retrenchments and layoffs due to deindustrialization. But the fact that many parts of the producing, you know, in the subsistence sense, parts of our country have been subject over the last decade to a drought, which is an ecological manifestation of the crisis. Uh, and that has had implications on the ability of homes to be able to produce food for their own needs and for the needs of others. And so in a sense, any growth plan that will be credible in South Africa and that will be seen as credible has to respond to how do you protect the consumption baskets of the poorest households in the society. I think the second one is this issue around infrastructure. And we can see in many of the municipalities and even across you know, our national network industries that there's a need for a massive re-injection of capital spending into the maintenance, repair, and even the provisioning of new infrastructure. And we need to corner the value chains that are critical to that, cement, steel, and I think we've started to do that uh, as a country, interestingly, now. And I call that in the book, securing the home. Uh, and it might even be the securing of the firm and even securing the public goods broadly. Um, but I think for me, the knock-on impacts of those types of investment in the immediate, through construction jobs, through upstream impact on steel, cement, and other value chains, and even timber is a critical input. But I think even for future economic activity, uh, creates enabling environment for that. Then I think the last one is to secure what I call critical transitions. You've touched on the digital one, so I'm not going to belabor that one. But I think the other one is this energy transition that we are undertaking now. And how do we make sure that in that transition, we are able to equip our people to access whatever economic opportunities might arise from that? It might be, as I make the example in the book, the case of securing component manufacturing for wind technology in the Eastern Cape because we know over a third of the wind investments in the REIPP have come through from the Eastern Cape. It might be, as ESCOM has said, capacitating our TVET colleges to run a massive skilling program around the repair installation of microgrids in the solar PV value chain. So all of these things 
are very practical micro interventions that are responding to macroeconomic realities faced within the home, faced within the firm, and I argue faced within a changing future that is going to be defined by a few critical transitions that many of us are going to have to be alive to and are going to have to consider in very, very meaningful ways. I think if we can be able to do those three things, then in a way we position South Africa over the next few decades for a path towards much greater, not only competitiveness, economic inclusion, but also will be able to resolve questions around the division of wealth in the society and what Fanon also says are the attendant social relations that arise from an uneven division of the wealth in the society. There was Ayabong Akdawe speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled The Economy on Your Doorstep, The Political Economy that explains why South African economy misfires and what to do about it.